Welcome to Introduction to Hebrew. This series of videos accompanies the textbook of the same name by PNR Publishing. The ideal for these videos is that they enable professors to create an upside down classroom where a student can watch the videos, read the book, and prepare all the exercises in advance of class time. That then allows a Hebrew class to spend 100% of its time working on the issues and areas where students have trouble understanding, troubleshooting, and helping develop the best possible learning because all of the time is used for students themselves to read Hebrew. Additionally, these videos are meant to enable people to use the book for self-study. You can watch the videos and then you can, having studied the chapter, try to do the exercises, and you can always come back and review material as needed. For each of these chapters that we will go through, the way to use the videos is to first watch the videos and read the chapter in the book. That will give you a thorough introduction to the material that's covered. Each video section will end with an introduction to the exercises, and having finished that and studied the chapter, you should try to do the exercises without consulting the book. Once you have finished that, go back and go through your exercises consulting the book to correct any areas you couldn't understand. And then only after doing those two steps, use the key to the book, the answers to all the exercises, which is available at introduction to hebrew.com on that website you will find other helps for your study as well vocabulary apps for both the iphone and android systems soon a parsing app which will also be released on both platforms an introduction to the graded reader that accompanies this book and is meant to follow it and also what's called an errata list a list of cases where the current print edition may need small corrections. Before you go through the rest of the book, you should download that errata list and make any changes so you're certain that you are working with the correct version of each page as you study. So we will begin our study of Hebrew by learning the alphabet. Now we should say right at the beginning that that isn't necessarily the best place to begin in learning a language. If you consider when you learned your own native language, you'll remember that you did not do so by learning a written alphabet. When a young boy or girl learns the first language they learn from the conversation they have with parents or caregivers or others, they actually don't learn to write. They hear these various sounds that these people make, and as time goes by, they start to associate those sounds with words and those words with meanings, and they're able to learn the language, in fact, entirely orally. By the time a young boy or girl has gotten into seventh or eighth year of life, he or she is able to understand most every complex sentence structure or working of grammar in a language. Now, that boy or girl may have just learned to read or may not know how to read yet. He or she may have learned an alphabet, but even if they have never learned the alphabet or learned to read, they know the language. They will pick up vocabulary as the years go by, but the basic function of the language has been set, and that was done entirely orally. Now, also, to be fair, at that stage of life, you had going on what linguists call the language acquisition mechanism, which is really a fancy way of saying that as a young child from about age two to five, you are simply made to learn language. You are a sponge and you can soak up a language in a way that will never quite happen again. So as adult language learners, much less adult learners of a language that is not their own, and in fact, as adult learners of a language that is now a primarily written language, 
used for religious purposes, but is different than the modern Hebrew you would use if you went to Israel today, we can't learn the language entirely the same way. That being fully said, we ought to, in learning a language, do as much as we can to do what we do out loud. All the various symbols you see when you read written words are merely ways of taking the sounds that people speak and putting them down on paper or on a computer screen. And so it is entirely arbitrary which symbol you use to represent which sound. In English, my native language, we use the symbol B or B, depending if you're upper or lower case, to represent the sound B. But there's no reason that we couldn't all agree to use that symbol to represent the sound B. As long as we all agree and understand the writing system, you can take any set of spoken sounds and write them down with any alphabet and writing system. And for that reason, everything you do as you learn this language, you should do out loud. By doing that, you'll be learning it in a more natural way. And if you are speaking out loud while looking at the letters, you'll be using more than one learning channel, which is always more effective in your learning. Our first task is to learn the alphabet, the system of symbols that was used to write down the sounds that were biblical Hebrew. And with that, we begin studying the alphabet. Hebrew is written from right to left, and the Hebrew alphabet consists of 23 consonants. Vowel sounds are indicated differently, not with letters, but with a system of marks that we will explain later in the chapter. As we deal with the Hebrew letters, we will both discuss how to write the letter, the name of the letter, and the sound that it makes. We'll also mention what is called the transliteration of the letter. A transliteration, in our case, is the English letter that is used as an equivalent to write the same sound that the Hebrew letter represents. The first four letters of the Hebrew alphabet are Aleph, Beit, Gimel, and Dalit. An Aleph, the first letter, is written with a stripe that goes from left to right, and then two small connecting stripes that do not quite form a straight line. Aleph is the non-sound, and by that we mean it is what is called a glottal stop. It's when you stop the air from coming out of your mouth, but in this case it is voiceless, so there is no pronunciation of an Aleph. It's important to understand, however, though you make no sound, the Aleph is a written Hebrew letter. If we represent that letter with English letters, we have no English letter that represents making no sound, but stopping the air from coming out of your mouth. So we simply use a small apostrophe to represent the sound of the Aleph. The second letter is a bait. For bait, you form the letter by going across and down with a curve and then writing a base across the bottom. Bait is the sound B. When it makes the B sound, there is a dot in it called a dagesh lene. And we'll explain that dagesh in the next section of this chapter. That sound is represented by the English B right here. Now, if there is no dot, you see in parentheses here, that is a bait without the dagesh. It makes instead of a b sound like but, a v sound like the v in vat. So if you were to see the form of bait with no dagesh in it, you would say v. If you were to write that with English, the convention is that we still use the letter b but we put a line underneath it indicating that it is a v sound, not a b sound. In either case, the letter is still bait, 
The question is simply whether that dot called the dagesh is present or not. The third letter of the Hebrew alphabet is called a gimel. You make a small angled line and then a vertical line, and then you make a small angled off line from that down to the base of the letter. Like bait and like dalit, which will follow, the gimel can take either the dagesh or not. Gimel makes the g sound. And in the case of gimel, we will pronounce a gimel with or without the dagesh the same way, g as in God. Note though that it can be transliterated either way. We will discuss the difference between these two again later in the chapter. And then the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Dalit. You take a horizontal line and then you follow and connect that with a vertical line and note that a Dalit has a little sharp angle poking out. The horizontal line goes a bit past the vertical line. A Dalit is the sound duh. It is like the gimel and the bait capable of taking the dagesh lene, but like gimel, we say it the same way either way in our pronunciation, duh, as in the D in dog. But if you transliterate into English characters, you will either write duh for a dalit which has a dagesh, or D with the underline under it for a dagesh that does not have the dalit. So the first four letters of the Hebrew alphabet are Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit. Before you move on to the next letters, get to where you can first say these four from memory. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit. Having gotten to where you can do that, then begin to write the letters as you say them. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit. Do that until you can safely and reliably both say the letters in order and write them. Then you're ready to move on to the next four letters. The next three letters in the Hebrew alphabet are He, Vav, and Zion. He is formed with a cross line and a vertical line, and then a second vertical line which does not touch the top line. He makes the sound ha, as in the English word he, and it is translated by an h. A vav is formed with a slight slanted line connected to a vertical line. A vav makes the sound v, as in vet, and is transliterated with the English V. And then Zion has again a small slanted line and a vertical line, but note the difference. The head of the Zion extends past its vertical line. Zion is how the sound Z, for instance, Z as in zip, Z is represented in Hebrew. And that is transliterated with the English letter that represents the same sound, the Z. Just like you did with the first four letters, now begin to say these three letters first until you can speak them from memory. He, Vav, Zion. He, Vav, Zion. And then speaking them while writing them. He, Vav, Zion. He, Vav, Zion. Once you can do this, combine these three letters with the first four. So you should be able to say Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zion. Continue doing this until you have all seven letters mastered and then move on to the next set of letters. The next three Hebrew letters are Chet, Tet, and yod. Chet is formed like he, but the second vertical on chet connects all the way up to the horizontal line. 
A het is a ch-ish sound, but the ch-ish sound that you would get from the English word lock. So be careful though, hey and het look very similar. They are two different letters. And when you say a het, you should get a bit of a rumble in your throat as you go ha to make the sound. Be careful not to say ha, but ha when you make a het. A het is represented in English transliteration with an H, but importantly, a dot underneath the H to distinguish it from the hay sound. A tet is formed by a small diagonal line connected to a rounded remainder of the letter. Tet is a very emphatic t sound, the T as in tamp. And as a very emphatic T sound, when we transliterate it into English, we reuse a T, but also the dot underneath. It's a T with a very strong T. And then Yod is a small letter graphically written up at the top of the line. Hebrew letters will tend not to be based on a bottom line, but instead to almost be hanging from an imaginary top line. And a yod will not hang very far down from that top line. It is a small rounded letter. Yod is the sound ya, as in yet, and is transliterated into English with a Y. So now add these three letters to your study of the alphabet. Chet, tet, yod. Chet, tet, yod. Chet, tet, yod. And once you've completed adding these letters, go back and work the entire alphabet. Aleph, bait, gimel, dalit, Hey, Fav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod. Remember, keep speaking everything you do out loud while you write it and while you read it. The next four Hebrew letters are Kaf, Lamed, Mem, and Nun. Now with Kaf, the first of these four, we have the formation is basically a rounded letter that goes from the line down to the sort of base. Note that a kaf is a different letter than a bait, but if you're not very careful to notice the difference, you might mistake them. Kaf, like some of the earlier letters, can take this dot that we called a dagesh lene. And again, we will explain that more in section two. But with the dagesh lene, a cough makes a k sound, as in the k in kit. And in that case, it's transliterated with a simple English k. If the dagesh lene is not present, so a cough with no dot, we have the ch-ish sound again, like in the lo word loch. So with the dagesh, we say k. Without it, we say ch. And we represent that in transliteration with a K and the line underneath. Kaf is also the first of the letters that we have come to, which takes what's called a final form. There are certain Hebrew letters, in fact, Kaf, Mem, and Nun, three of this grouping, take a different form when they are written as the last letter of a word. So a kaf will always be written as we've shown it, unless it is the final letter of the word. If it's the final letter, you have a cross piece and then a vertical line that hangs down below the other letters. It is the same letter and it is pronounced the same way. It's simply written with a different form when it's the last letter of a word. So you have kaf. Following kaf, you have lamid. A lamid is written with a vertical piece that goes above the imaginary line from which the letters hang, a horizontal piece, and then a tail. That tail usually 
will also match the bottom line, so it will often cut off right there. But it is not strange in certain manuscripts to have tails to lamids that extend quite far down at times. Lamid is the sound l, as in the English word lamp, and is represented in English transliteration with the L. The next letter is the Hebrew mem, the m sound, as in mom. A mem is formed by a triangular type shape with a little line coming off the left side of the triangle. Note that it does not close at the bottom. Mems in various fonts will change. Some will be more rounded. Some will even be more squared. In the final form of the word, in other words, if it is the last letter in the word only, mem is written as a box, and then the tail comes off almost at the top left corner. And again, whichever form you see, final or medial, which is the letter as written in the middle or beginning of a word, it has the same sound value. Mm. It's just written in a different form. And then finally, we have what's called noon. Noon is a small diagonal, a long vertical, and then a small foot. And a noon is the sound n, as in the word noun in English. It is transliterated with an English n. And noon also has a final form, which looks the same, except instead of a foot on the line, it hangs further down below the bottom of the other letters. So now add these four to your knowledge of the Hebrew alphabet. Kaf, Lamed, Mim, Noon. Kaf, Lamed, Mim, Noon. Practice saying them, then add saying them while you write them, and then add these four to your extended knowledge. Now you're getting close to having the entire Hebrew alphabet. Then move on to the next set of letters. The next three letters of the Hebrew alphabet are Samik, Ayin, and Pe. Samik is the s sound, as in the English s in sat, and it is transliterated with a simple English s. Ayin is the second of the two letters that is a glottal stop. You'll remember the very first letter of the alphabet, Aleph, was also a glottal stop. This is when you stop the air from coming out of your mouth. The difference between the two, however, is that while Aleph has no sound, an ayin stops the air and makes a sound. The challenge for people who are native English speakers is that the sound an ayin makes is almost impossible for someone who does not have a native grasp of a Semitic language to make. My first Hebrew instructor told me that it's basically the sound you make right before you vomit. For that very reason, most English speakers, when they learn to read Hebrew, simply treat the ayin as a silent letter as well. That is fine, and it is what you should do for pronunciation, but you need to be very careful to remember that an ayin technically would have a sound. For that reason, instead of the Aleph's transliteration, we use the opposite apostrophe. And be very careful to remember that an ayin is not an Aleph. And then we have Pe. Pe is the P sound, as in the P in the English word pet. You'll notice that it has this dot that we call the Dagesh Lene. Without the Dagesh, Pe makes a much softer sound because air is flowing out. The F, like the PH in the English phone. Pe is also a letter that in final form has a distinct form with a tail hanging below the bottom of most other Hebrew letters. So now add Samik, Ayin, and Pe to your alphabet. Samik, Ayin, Pe. Samik, Ayin, Pe. You now ought to be able to go from Aleph to Pe.
Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mim, Nun, Samak, Ayan, Peh. You have only six letters left. The next three letters are Tzade, Kof, and Resh. A Tzade is written with a slanted line and then a horizontal line and then another slanted line that joins it. Tzade is a tz sound, sort of as the TS in the English word bats. Because it's a tz sound, we have no English consonant that exactly corresponds to that, so we transliterate by the S, but also note carefully the dot underneath. That tells you you're saying tz. Tzade is another letter that has a final form. The final form of a tzade, like many of the final forms you'll note, has transferred the horizontal bottom line to a line that hangs below the other letters. Kof is written with a long vertical stripe that hangs below the typical and then a rounded piece. A kof is the sound k, sort of as the English word king. It is transliterated with the English q. It's very important to remember that the sound of a kof is a k sound. You'll see this letter if you are used to reading English and try to say p. But remember, p is from is represented by the Hebrew consonant p. A kof is a k sound, and for that reason, we'll want to be very careful not to mispronounce words which have a kof in them. Then third, you have the Hebrew letter resh. A resh has a curve. You'll notice that it looks much like a dalit, but the difference is a dalit has the little jut out at the side, whereas a resh is a smooth letter. Resh is the sound r, r and as in rat in English, and is transliterated with r. So add to your alphabet now tsade, kof, resh. Tsade, kof, resh. Now finally, the last three letters of the Hebrew alphabet are Sin, Sheen, and Tav. Sin and Sheen are written with the same symbol, a curve within a diagonal line, the difference being a little dot that is placed above the letter. Sin, which is the S sound, s, as in sip, is written with the dot to the left, and it is represented in English transliteration by an S with the diagonal mark above it. Sheen is the same symbol, however, the superlinear above the line dot is written to the right. It is the sound sh, as in ship. In English, therefore, we would transliterate with an S, but then the caret over it indicating the sound that is represented by sheen is sh. And then finally we have tav. Tav is written with a horizontal and then vertical line, another vertical line, but unlike tet, unlike het, a tav has a foot to the left. Tav with the dot we call the dagesh makes a t sound, t as in tamp. Tav without the dagesh, we will also say with a T sound as in tamp. But notice the difference between the two. And again, we will explain that as the rest of the chapter goes on. So now add these last three letters, seen, sheen, tav. Seen, sheen, tav. After you've been able to say them, say them and write them. Seen, Sheen, Tav. 
Sin, Shin, Tav. Once you've done that, see if you can put together the entire alphabet. Aleph, Bait, Gimel, Dalit. He, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mim, Nun, Samik, Ayan, Pe, Sade, Kof, Resh, Sin, Sheen, and Tav. Work on that until you're able to both say the letters and write the letters so that you're capable of writing out the Hebrew alphabet. As we have already discussed while working through the alphabet, several of these letter forms can be confused with each other. The script I have just taught you, and a script is the term for the symbols, the letters we would call them, which are used to write down the sounds of a language. This script is called the Aramaic square script. Hebrew originally would not have been written in this script until later in the history of the Hebrew language. This script was adopted for writing Hebrew after the Babylonian exile and was largely used with the exception of a short period during the Maccabean revolt when the more ancient Hebrew script was attempted to be revived. In the Aramaic square script, which is what is used for printed editions of the Hebrew Bible, you'll want to be careful of the following letter confusions. Bait and Kaf, which look alike except for whether the bait has this little extension of the horizontal line. Gimel, Vav, and Zion, all of which are thin, skinny letters, with the difference being whether the head and the foot are present or not. Dalit, Resh, and a final Kaf. Both Dalit and the final Kaf have this very sharp angle, whereas Resh is smooth. And Dalit and Resh will end at the same level, where a final Kaf will extend below the line that forms the bottom of the other letters. You would also want to think about a final noon in this sense, because a final noon would extend down. It has a very narrow top, whereas Dalit and Resh will go further out. Final noon also can be, if you're not careful, confused with Vav, Zion, Gimel, or final noon, and that they are all very thin letters. We've already discussed the danger of confusing he and chet, if you're not careful to watch whether there's a continuation and connecting of the top lines. Chet and tav, which differ only in this foot on the tav. Depending on the font or script or handwriting, samek, which is rounded off, or a final mem, which is more squared. And in some cases, ayin and sade. They both have these two lines. The question is whether the join of the third line is at the bottom or in the middle of the diagonal line. So as you study, be careful to make sure you don't confuse these letters. Once you have mastered the entire alphabet and you can say the letters in order and write them, practice and you'll, until you can do it basically as quickly as you can write. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod, etc. Once you can both write and say the letters of the Hebrew alphabet at basically the speed that you're capable of writing them, you then want to move to air writing the letters. Now, instead of actually writing them, use your finger and look straight ahead and write the letter in the air while you make it sound. 
So looking straight ahead of yourself, hold up your finger and make the shape of an olive. And then, of course, there's no sound to make. Now the next letter. Hold your finger up in the air in front of you. Trace the shape of a bait and say ba. Then trace the shape of a gimel, say ga. Work through all the Hebrew letters, working so that you can write them in the air and make the sound that they make. Don't worry so much about saying the name. Simply make the shape and make the sound. What you're now doing is making sure that when you have a grasp in your mind, you understand the shape of the letter and the sound that it is meant to correspond with. After you have been able to do this successfully for all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, go through the alphabet again, now writing the letter in the air in front of you with your finger. Aleph, Bait, Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samik, Ayan, Pe, Tsade, Kof, Resh, Sin, Shin, Tav. Practice until you are able to do that, writing each letter in the air and making the sound that it would make. Then you're ready to move on to the next section. We have mentioned the term transliteration. Transliteration is writing the same sounds with different symbols. In particular, then, it can be used to use English letters or the letters, frankly, of any other alphabet to write the sounds of Hebrew. Any language, in fact, is independent of the alphabet in which it's written down. So, for instance, my name is the English word Bill, but I could quite easily write that in Hebrew as B, and then I would use a vowel that we call a hirek. We'll come back to that to make the I sound. And then two lamets, bill. And note, my bus should have a foot sticking out to the right. So you can take any set of vocalized things, words said out loud, and write them down using the letters of any given script. Now, the reason that you need to know of transliteration is that many reference works, especially reference works from earlier eras where you tended to typeset the work, will tend to write their Hebrew words with transliteration instead of using this Aramaic square script you have learned. So if you want to use an older commentary or certain reference works, they will not write the Hebrew word kum or any other Hebrew word. They might have the Hebrew word sham or shame or something like that. But what you will find written instead in English would be sham. So when you see a word written in transliteration in a reference work, what you should do is speak the word out loud. If you see this, say sham, and that will trigger your understanding once you're a few chapters in to know that it references this word, which you will have learned. You're not required in my courses to memorize the transliteration symbols, nor are you required to be able to go back and forth between transliteration and Hebrew Aramaic square script. However, when needed, you should be able to use the chart in section one to recognize and sound out the word that's being represented in the transliteration. The pronunciations that you have been being taught in this section follow the modern system of pronunciation for the Hebrew alphabet. There is what is called the classical system, 
an older system of pronouncing the script, and that is still sometimes used in academic settings. That classical pronunciation differs in how a few letters are spoken. Particularly, it differs in dealing with the letters Vav, Tet, and Kof. It also differs in how it deals with the letters that have what we call the Dagesh Leni, that dot in the middle of certain consonants. We'll talk about that distinction in section two. You should learn for the purposes of this class and this study the modern pronunciation. But should you need to know it, the differences in classical pronunciation for the three letters Vav, Tet, and Kof are that Vav, instead of being said with a V, was probably said with a W, W and as in weight. Tet, which we are saying T, T as in tamp, was said more with a ta, a, a, a more gentle T, T as in top. And kof, which we're saying ka as in king, was said more with k as in lack, the CK in the English word lack. Unless your instructor tells you to use the classical pronunciation, it's best to just learn and use the modern pronunciation at this point.